Where did you live in Mexico? In Mexico, I'm living in the north part of Mexico. It's kind of desertic area. So it's a small city called Saltillo, near to Monterrey. I don't know if people know. Monterrey we heard of, yeah, at least yeah, some yeah, of us. Of but then, so it's a sort of deserted, without water, arid area, right? True. What did it prevent you from doing? Or something that... Swimming, swimming. I always dream on swimming, and I couldn't. In the desert area, there is no lake, no... Or shall not be nothing to swim, not even swimming pools. For us from this region, it's a bit difficult to, to figure that to out. Yeah, but I understand that. And then I understand learning swimming has been your secret wish for a long time, True. but also a great fear. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have some kind of anxiety to, to, to be inside the water. Right. But you managed to overcome it. I managed, I mean, it was not easy because I was 42 years old when I learned. And in Germany, when you learn to swim so old, man, this is not normal. So this, the, the people was uh, laughing at me, of me, and then it was kind of a change for me. But I, I managed, I did it. So you take challenges? Yeah, Good. I love it. What will you help us learn today from you? Uh, from the presentation or from me? From the presentation. That never give up and stay humble. This is the last message. Okay, awesome. I'm letting you with the audience. Audience, this is Norma's first time in Belgrade. So please be kind, be gentle. Make sure you type in the questions into the Match About app. We'll leave 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, sort of, and then we show up here. Let's roll. Definitely. Yeah. It's the last one, guys. Woo. I don't tell you what. <laughs> but I will not talk about me too much, but the important here is to see that I have been working for Ericsson 27 years. In these 27 years, many, many things have happened, many transformations, many uh, challenges that we were facing. And then I was doing developing, testing, I was doing troubleshooting. I mean, at the end, I finished doing delivery to the customer. And then that's why I bring this topic, because I would like to bring you one story, and not just theory, one story. And I live this story, and I live it with a lot of passion. I was part of it. So, but let's start with Debos. What is DevOps? How many of you can say what is DevOps? How many? Raise your hand. Yeah! What is this, my dear? You build it. This is a principle, yes, of course. Yeah, when I was troubleshooting, a troubleshooter, I would like to have this mantra in my table, but it didn't exist in that time. What else? Someone else? Raise the hand there. So basically, it's uh, developing tools that you can use for various things. Uh -huh. Good. Then, let's look. Um, let's make another question before we go to what is Debo. Who are the Debo people who should be there? Who say the people here in front should be there? Who? Everybody on, on the team. Who is the team? Who are in the team? Developers. developers. Just developers. Hmm. What about ops? So, sorry. The IT ops, someone else, I hear one lady there. Testers, what do you think? Integrators, all these people should be there. All these people should be there, for sure. I like this company. This company, one, one of the first one talking about DevOps in the 1999, more or less, uh, version one. Now they have a ball and now they have another name. But anyway, in that time, they came with a definition of DevOps. 
But if you can see, this definition of DevOps is a definition of what is not DevOps. It starts with what is not DevOps. And it's very funny because this company was devoted at the beginning of its existence with tools. But they said clearly, DevOps is not a tool. DevOps is not even a process. DevOps is values. DevOps make us to communicate constantly, to collaborate. This is DevOps. This integration and automation, of course there are tools involved. Of course there are processes involved. But it's not the tools, it's not the process. Do you remember the first uh, uh, speech that we have yesterday morning from John? He say, let's give more value to people and interaction than to tools and processes. And this is exactly DevOps. But let's see what the others said. Because they said what is not and a little bit of what it is. But what about why we do it? Why we do DevOps? Why we follow DevOps? Then they give a little bit more, they go a little bit more deeper. And, and this guy said, okay, we need to gain efficiency, speed, and security when we develop software and when we deliver software. Then they go a little bit farther. They say, why we communicate? Why we collaborate? Why we integrate faster? Why we test? Uh, we have the automation during testing. They say why, but still we are not arriving there. Let me, and bear with me, let me take this uh, sentence for its scale AI. And they go and say why. The result we want, what we really want, the objective and the purpose to have DevOps, all this collaboration, all this interaction, the tools, the processes, is to deliver the solution to the operators. Let's give the product to them. They, they, um, let's let's uh, start getting feedback early and frequently from them. And then, of course, let's allow them to start making money with the software. This is software and hardware. This is the ultimate purpose of DevOps. So now we see what is not, we see what it is, and we see why it is. Yeah? We good? Then I, I, I a visual person, I like uh, a lot of pictures. And these pictures say what it is. is constant exploration of the needs of the customer, constantly developing this uh, solution, constantly put it together, constantly integrating them, and release all this, so that the customer can have the different releases of our solution on demand. They can decide when to take it, when to take it. I don't know if some of you have experienced this, that when you are doing something very important, like today we are doing, I mean, suddenly uh, you receive a push from the system saying, hey, hey, time to make upgrade. Time to make reset of your computer because you receive a new feature. And then you are in the middle of a meeting, in the middle of a presentation, and you need to do it. This was in the past. Now is put all the pieces of software there, all the features there, and let the customer to take it when they want it. When they want it. This is DevOps. And now, let's go to the story. The story is about Ericsson. I don't know how many of you have a telephone, cellular telephone with you. Yeah, it's someone here who has not a telephone. A uh, cellular telephone, a Hindi? Someone say, no, I don't. Nobody, good, good. I also have one. 
all these uh, uh, devices are using Ericsson software. All of them. It doesn't matter if it's Huawei, your telephone, or if it's Nokia, it doesn't matter. There are these, uh, there is one node, that is the central node, that control all this switching and the, in, in these networks that we were working with in Ericsson. We were working with so many products, but I will work, I will talk about this specific product. And then Ericsson is so big, huge, so you can imagine try, uh, trying DevOps in such a constellation. But let's start with the beginning. I mean, I started working for Ericsson Germany in 2000. And in 2000, I mean, they were having a big shark. No, I cannot say shark. I can say a small fish, but with so big teeth, trying to eat Ericsson. Do you remember what the name of this, of our fierce competitor? In that time, it was very small. It was called Huawei. Huawei was small, small enough that you can say, ah, Huawei, we are Ericsson. Yeah, we were so proud. But I don't know, in the past, we used to say, the big fish eat the, the smaller fish. But in 2010, the faster fish eat the slower. Doesn't matter the size of the fish. The faster eat the slower. And this happened to Ericsson. And then this is where my story begins. Ericsson is in a city called Aachen. Hey, nobody? Someone of you have been in Aachen? You need to be there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a historical city. Anyway, so one of you have been in call. Someone say yes. Who else? Yeah, good. Um, Aachen is about uh, 75 kilometers uh, from, from call. And then this company, Ericsson Eurolab, was there. I was part of this company, more or less 600, 650 person devoted to deliver this mobile switching center. This was our product. Together with other teams in Greece, in Italy, in China, uh, in Sweden, we delivered this nice product. And the organization in that time, 2010, we were formed by kind of, of uh, uh, departments, let's call it like this. It was one organization for the architects, one organization who do the, the requirements, another organization who do the development, and so on and so on and so on, until the last organization that is not even shown here. It was a long, long list of organizations delivering one, one piece of information or a piece of something to the next organization to develop, to test, to integrate, to operate, and so on and so on. This was a long queue. And then, can you imagine, with this long queue of experts contributing to the development and delivery, how frequent do we deliver to the customer? Imagine, try to imagine. Once a year, but look, some, I mean, you are so generous. But in this time, we were delivering every 14, maybe 16 months. So it was improving all the time, but, but that time it was more than one year. From the starting the talking or receiving the requirements from the customer until we can operate the product in the customer premises. It was amazing. This is, we were following the waterfall. I mean, you can, you can imagine. Eh? And then many, I say now funny, but uh, I mean, if you think about it, it was not funny at all. Stories happen. I mean, uh, we have these um, silos. 
KPIs. In Spanish is KPIs, in, in, in English is uh, key performance indicators. And then we have KPIs per each organization. So we developers, we need to code lines of codes. My God, lines of code. I remember this KPI. Uh, a number of, of uh, problems in testing should be zero, and so on, this kind of, of KPI. And then the people in, in integration and verification has another ones. Can you imagine which ones? The people who was doing testing. What kind of, of uh, performance indicators do you imagine they have? Is there any tester here? Yeah, tell me. I mean, what kind of, of uh, key performance indicators those a tester can imagine in, for the testing organization? The number of bugs should be high. But the developers say, no, the number of bugs should be low. Can you imagine which kind, which kind of, of uh, conflicts um, pop up because these contradicting uh, indicators? I mean, very frequent, I mean, they, 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 I was a developer in that time, very frequent, the people who integrate or the testers said, hey, hey, this is a fault. And the developers say, no, hey, this is a feature. And then when the tester proved this is a fault, what do we developers do? We go to the people who give us the requirements. They say, hey guys, here there is a, a fault in the requirements. No, this is not a fault. This is a misunderstanding of requirements. You misunderstand the requirements. Can you see this? Because we have this stupid, uh, local, local indicators, and we were devoted, and our bonus was tied to this, to this number, so we need to cash this number. Yes, ne? it should be like this, otherwise you don't have it. So at the end, this ping pong made the delivery so difficult that when we arrive to the customer and say, we are ready to deliver. We are ready to make the upgrade if there's going to be an upgrade or if it's going to be a new installation to install the product in your labs or in your premises. They say, oh my God, how long is going to be take the, the, the upgrade or the installation? Oh, the whole night. And then what happened at the end? No, I don't want it. I don't want it. This is one of the reasons why we didn't deliver every six months. Because the customer, anyway, they didn't want this software every six months. Because they cannot bear to have the whole night of one day lost. This one, one, one of, the, of the obstacles, impediments. This could not happen anymore. And in 2010, and the company said, no, we need to stop, we need to rethink, we need to investigate, we need to see what is outside. We need to go out of our bubble, because we were a giant, so it's easy to be lost in a giant. And then start to look in. I mean, we know it's going to be painful. We know it's going to be, for many people, um, frustrating, but we need to change our way of thinking. And they took some time, they went uh, apart, and they start investigating this agility. Can agility be applied to a huge company? In the past, I mean, agility was there for years already, but the idea of Ericsson was agility is for small companies. I mean, I still find this thinking in some of the, of the companies, of the big companies. Who of them are coming from a company with more than 10,000 uh, employees? Yeah. The others? Lucky guys. 
So because this is true. I mean, the Ericsson said, but the agility, this is for, for the small companies. We need something bigger. We need a group, rational, unified processes. We need IBM, wah, 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 wah. But let's try. Let's try. Let's try with one pilot. And we start piloting. I mean, one of the aspects I would like to touch with you today is the people aspect. Why? Because, well, tell me why. Tell me why. Why the people aspect is the most difficult one? It's unpredictable, it's complex, and touch the culture. We need to touch deeply the culture. I mean, we took a decision. This will not be a, a cargo culture. If we will change, we will change from the very deep our values, our first, uh, our uh, beliefs, we will really change from the very profound part. And this is a cultural change. So we decided and took for the pilot the Scrum framework. And it was a small pilot. It was about 120 uh, developers developing a small feature for, for the product. Um, and then after we scale it. But let me tell you something here. When you are going to take to work with the culture, you need one role, and this role is crucial, crucial. And this is the role of the Scrum Master. How many of you have a Scrum Masters? How many of you is Scrum Master? We have, oh my God, I'm so happy. I'm so happy, guys, fellows. Then why? Because you need to work and the culture of the people. And this is not easy. You need to have some technical understanding of what is happening, but also you need to have these uh, soft skills to treat with, to deal with people. Some kind of little bit of psychologies, but also some ideas of what the product is, but also to understand the business, the overall view a systematic view. So, congratulations. This change cannot happen with no Scrum Master. So, the Scrum, you know it. Lisa explained this morning all about the Scrum. So, I will skip it and I will go to the other dimension. The other dimension is the technical dimension. Why? Because we were delivering to the testing organization, to the functional testing organization, one time every three months. And the testing organization delivered to the integrators one time every six months. And then, then they thinking that no, we need, we need, we need to accelerate the feedback loops. It's not enough to have a Scrum teams. We need also to tackle the technical problems we have. We need to start having this feedback loop very, very faster than before. And this slide was shown to us by Ericsson in 2010, at the end of the year. They showed this one and said, guys, we need this one. How can we do it? And they start talking with the testers and with the developers because they are the expert. This is something that had happened in the company. The company started delegating these um, decisions to the experts. Yesterday we were looking at one, one, one of the presentations talking about expert, about mastery. And this is respect. The people respect because they are master. They can do it. They can bring solution. And this is what Ericsson do. How can we do to accelerate the feedback loops? And this was called in that time DevOps. DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Bad news. We start to look in the in the in the 
we went a lot of seminars, Scrum Master was sent to everywhere to do, let's see what is the industry doing. And we went to this, to this uh, seminar called UCAAT, User Conference and on Advanced Automated Testing. We, we went there, all of us, and we saw that our industry, we were really, really a thousand years old regarding automated testing. But we were not the only ones. There are many companies who were lacking the ability to test automatically. And we were one of, the, of these companies. I took this photo there. And we start to investigate tools, we start to look in. I would like to say that Ericsson in that time were, was using very heavy tools like IBM, tool, IBM tools and so on. So then we, were bring, we start bringing some open source tools. So and we start to analyze in the, the, the panoramic and then we start to selecting some of these tools for the collaboration. But who knows this guy? He's sometimes quite arrogant, but here I should say he was humble. Yes, exclusive automation at Tesla was a mistake. To be precise, my mistake, humans are underrated. He said it, not me, and that's why I will focus on humans now. So this was in 2010. And then the first step was, let's create, let's put people together and let's create cross-functional teams. But I ask you a question, Scrum Master. If you said to the people who just arrived to your team and you have a, new, a brand new team and then you say, hey, guys, guys, collaborate, communicate, please do it together. Is this going to happen if you just have experts? You say no, why? Because they speak another language. They don't understand each other. They are coming for different words. They are coming totally from, they speak other languages. They don't know how what I'm doing affect the other. How can this contribute to others? So you need to provoke that this communication start to happen in, by speaking the same language. And what can you do? What can you do to make this a group of experts to be a team? Scrum Masters, where are you? Yeah. Ask them to share their, their language, their Aha, what else can we do? We can do a lot of things. I mean, we can start to make them to talk to each other, and you have so many means. And then what is for the tester a failure, explain why it is a failure for the developer. Developer explain why this is a feature, and so on and so on. And this is exclusively work from a Scrum Master together with the support of management. I'm hurry up. And then we were following, so following something called T-shape. I will not go into the T-shape because uh, in yesterday in the third chat about when we were talking about the expertise, we were talking about what it is. But we start to apply and the Scrum Master start to understand what is this T-shape. Is we are receiving experts and then they need to start to share information and to learn the language and to see how what I'm doing as a developer is affecting the, the testing, the integration and so on. So we start to promote a lot of collaboration and then with ceremonies we learn, with rotation we learn, with social event, all this help us to allow us to go there. At the end of the experiment, Ericsson was super, super, super happy. Why? Because the customer was happy. They were really amazed from what Ericsson achieved and in short time. And then they published this. 
This is the one, the publishing from Ericsson, and this is the press release. Ericsson enables to provide LTE roaming. That was the first product Ericsson did with agility. And something, a miracle happened, a miracle. In big companies, uh, it's very difficult that you meet the customer, especially if you have so many customers like Ericsson. But in this occasion, the customer would like to know the team who make it possible. And they came to our premises and say, hello, I'm Swisscom. Thank you. We drink together. It was amazing. It was really, really, really nice. Natural next step. I mean, if we see here, we have these agile teams, and we have the architects, we have the developers, we have the functional tester in this yellow block. But then, what else can we do? What else can we do? What is the next natural step? Someone there? Sorry? Exactly. Let's expand. Let's expand. Let's bring the others to the boat. Why? Because no matter how agile you become in this yellow uh, box, I mean, to go live, it will to take the same time as before. So we need that all the people start to collaborate. The whole change. And that is what we did. We scale agility. We follow our, our imagination. In that time, scale agile didn't exist, less didn't exist, anything of this exists. But the people start talking about SOS, about uh, other companies who was achieving this escalation, and then we decide to do it. So the purpose, at the end of every interaction, we should have code that we can ship to the operation. At the end of each interaction, we have interaction of three weeks in that time. And it should run in the environment. Which environment, you can ask. We have so many environments in, in the telecommunications company. So another thing and a big step and this is for the ones who are working in, a, in the strategic level. Who is from you working in that level, in the C level, strategic? Some, some one of you are working there? Because this is for them. This is for them. So, sorry, they miss it. Take it with you guys. So, the company said, let's start to put objectives on impact. Let's start to forget a little bit about uh, performance indicators. Let's have some, some of them, because we do not have illimited resources. We need some performance indicators. But let's think in impact. Impact. I was a developer. When I was a developer, I developed one, one um, piece of software who was, oh my god, sorry, it will sound arrogant, but was really good. Cool. <laughs> so I was so proud of it, my manager also, and then it was provoking no problems. But two years after I, I delivered this, this piece of software, I asked my manager, can we know how many customers are using it? Do you know how many? So few. I was discouraged. I mean, it's nothing worse than doing your best to have something excellent, but nobody uses it. It's, it's, it's waste. It's waste. And this is discouraging me. So that's why the company decided, let's go with another strategic um, framework. Let's use objective key results. And let's put the objective on the top. So to avoid the people start to making silos, to avoid the people start to running for a number, let's divorce these numbers from the money so that the people feel inspired. Let's have a vision together. And they call the development teams 
representative of the development teams, and they make this exercise. We listen one very good uh, 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 chat today of one, uh, someone, I don't remember the name, someone from England was uh, talking about this, not the this model, but about involving the people in this developing of a strategy, developing of, of a metrics and all this, developing on portfolio, developing on the backlog, developing of actionables. So then they take us on consideration. The next step was now let's scale the team and let's bring people who never have worked with development inside the team. Let's start to talk in the same language. Let's start understanding what is the problem product management have, troubleshooters have, and they bring people from all over to make this big team. Communication, one word for the ones who are Scrum Master. You, you guys are the ones who organize this one. The people need, in our case, we were meeting 30 minutes, 85 person, every morning, in the morning at 8.30, we meet, some of them were remote, Greece, Italy, China were remote, um, no, China was not there. What's Greece, Italy, someone from Sweden was there, and we meet and we talk, and we talk not too much because this grandmaster was there, checking the clock, checking the, the information that was flowing, was the correct information, was the necessary information to achieve our objectives. We define a kind of a pipeline for us. This was the pipeline. I, I draw it. It's there. Now I don't like it, I will draw it again, but in that time it serves to the purpose. And then we say we will continuously developing, exploring, and we will continue delivery. In 2017, we can publish this. You can have the product update every month instead of every year. This, we are talking about speeding, we are talking about doing a good job. And Swisscom was so happy because then almost after a couple of months, we could start delivering twice per month. And you know what? The customer wants it. It's not anymore this, no, please, no, no. I cannot there. I cannot spend eight, spend eight hours in, in upgrading the software, installing. They were begging and said, yes, twice per month is okay. Because then it took just one hour, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And this was wonderful. Is the natural next step in this story? Sorry? Share. That's what we are doing here, but inside the company. Continuous deployment. Continue. Uh, this continuous deployment we we manage, but. We can shorten the period. We can say we can deliver to the customer like Amazon. How many times Amazon delivered to the customer? You don't even notice. They deliver every, every second something new to the pipeline. And you don't even notice. So the natural step was to take the customer and to work together with them. And this we did. So, why we cannot stop walking? Why we cannot stop learning? I took this one from the last uh, report, a state of testing survey, and then we cannot sleep. We cannot stop walking. We cannot stop learning.
because others are also learning. So if you see this DevOps and Agile, or Agile-like, is some of the frameworks more used by the company. So we are learning, but the others, our competitors, the concurrents is also learning. That's why we need to learn fast. And they are also improving. This is, if you, if you compare from 2017, when they started doing this, this uh, survey, to 2022, is improving, is improving. Okay, I, I take this one for those who said, but which are the tools who the people use more? Which, uh, which tool are the company? companies using the most. So I, I put this one there. But the report is there, available in the internet. You can have a look. It's quite interesting. It's talk a lot about uh, DevOps. And my last slide for you, guys. And this is the first slide that the manager in Ericsson presented us in 2010. She went into the General Assembly and said, guys, what got us here won't get us there. We were so proud of it, Ericsson. We were so proud of having our own tools, our own language, our own proprietary, everything. But what has taken us there, we will not take us later. And this is the message. What got you here won't you get there. Never, never stop to learning. Never stop to challenging the status quo. Never, never. Oh, always, always be humble and learn. Never think, ah, oh, who are we? Never. This small one can be faster and then will eat you. With this one, I would like to thank you for your attention. And go to questions. I know you are tired. I know. I'm also tired, but I'm here. Am I happy to talk to you? Yeah. Questions, experiences. Maybe you have something. I promise you, it is not going to long, longer, so we can go after this home, but I would like you to encourage, to make questions, or to share with the other ones. The expert is not the one who is in the front. All of you have a story. All of you have experiences we can share. Yes, please. Ah, if you, if we are able to release at will multiple times per day, is it too late to wait for the end of the spring to do? the review. This is a very good question. For us, uh, we didn't release without having the review passed. I mean, we, we have this one because the stability, the security, it was so, so important for our customer. Then we took the decision not to release the product uh, before we have the demo. But what we did, what we did is every night, every night before the developers um, go home, they release to the pipe, they release to the, to the, they integrate, they make this one. So that the, during the night, the, the testing, the automate, uh, the automate testing, run the testing, and the next day in the morning, in this meeting at 8.30, they can bring if the if the was some breaks, so the people who made the push in Git can react. The team can react. The release to the customer was done twice per month. The release to the customer, but the integration and the testing was doing every night. Or everyone should commit whatever they have been developed. Yep, good. Another question, how got you the teams motivated for the new roles? Oh my God, this is a good question. Not at all. 
I mean, you just see the face of the, especially the integrators and the tester when they say, hey guys, you will be seated with the developers, you will be for one team. But these stupid developers, they don't know. I mean, they, 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 they and the developers were really demotivated about well, these, these guys. They don't have an idea what we are doing. It was a hard start. So, how we did it? I mean, we start to having a lot of team building activities. The Scrum Master, we start, they send us to prepare very well uh, to a kind of center of excellence. And then we start to finding ways to do it, to make it. Now, let me tell you something. There were people in that time that say, no, I don't believe in this. I will not do it. I will leave the company. What do you think the company did? Most of them were not developers, neither tester. Most of the people who decide to leave the company were middle management. What do you think Ericsson did? Oh, don't go, please, I will make you Scrum Master. Oh, I will make you, I don't know, whatever. They made themselves redundant. They say, I will leave and I will leave, and they leave. So if you leave the laggards to stay in the company, what they will do is they will drag you back. And then the company took a hard, very hard decision. We lost most of the project managers. We lost a lot of middle management. We lost them. And then, of course, but the good thing is that the company say, okay, detect all what is waste, all these reports, all this um, product revision information, all this, all what is waste, we will throw it away. Ah, but how come? Yeah, waste is waste, and we don't have enough muscles to do it anyway. Let's focus on what really matters. Yeah, so we did what we could. And the ones who didn't want to stay with us were invited to leave. Yep, good. Was there a lot of turnover when Agile was implemented in the team? Did the people embrace the, that time, external, external or by training? I mean, the people basically, the turnover, I mean, I tell you the truth, Ericsson had had, at this moment, um, a very low turnover. I mean, look at me. I was with Ericsson 27 years. 27 years. And I leave because I find something extremely better. Otherwise, I would be there still. So the turnover was very low in, low in that time. From developers, I should say, we don't lose developers. We didn't lose technical people. The technical people... They were really fast uh, learners. They really believed. At the beginning, it was kind of, nah, 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 but at the end, well, six months after we start with the, with the transformation, I asked my teams, I had two teams, that, guys, if we, will, if we would have the chance to go back to the previous way of working, what would you do? And they say, no, no way. I will leave the company if we go back. Why? Because they start to make decisions. They start to feel important. They start to feel that they have uh, impact in what they are doing. And this is very important. They need to know it. So uh, we will uh, understand it that the Scrum Master was crucial to your transformation. Where did you get them from at that time? External or what training? Yeah, good question. Um, I was in that time a uh, process, uh, process developer, process engineer, and uh, there was in my department 10 process engineers, and there was like 20 quality managers and configuration managers, and they put us in a, in a, in a, a row. And then they asked, do you, Norma, would like to do development again, because we will kill your role. We don't need any more uh, uh, software um, process engineers. 
<laughs> okay, yes. You, Amonena, you are quality manager. Do you want to be developer again, or do you want to leave? Mm, developer. Uh, this is what has happened. The one who said, yes, I can be a Scrum Master, I don't know what it is, it happened to me. I don't know what Scrum Master is, but this, I can try. They put it together, they send us in training, they give us a lot of books, and we start to learn, learn from others. So in that time, this Scrum Master was a role that didn't, even you hear about it. I said, but what is this? Ah, it doesn't matter, I will learn. So they teach us, because in 2010, in Germany, this didn't exist. It was some, something totally new. So, uh, okay, well, look. Any more questions, any more experiences? Yeah, my dear. The last one. Ah, the last one, there is one. Yeah. I will tell you something. It's true. Why? Because they will lose power. influence, power. Then, that's why they don't want, and especially when they don't understand what is going to be the added value to do all this. If before I was deciding when the people go on vacation, what kind of tool to buy, and which kind of report I will do. And we don't need to do this anymore. What's going to be my purpose on this organization? And then, it's true. It's not that the, the, this middle management was totally redundant. We still need some, but not all. So the ones who understand the purpose for them in the organization, they remain. All the others, they leave. And then, yeah, that's why we didn't stop them to leave. We didn't want any, anyone who do not believe in the transformation to stay. We invite them to leave. Because laggards are sabotage. Sabo Sabotage, do, do you know this word? Sabotage, the transformation. It's, it's like this, it's painful, but it's like this. So, so how did you deal with them? I mean, unless your company is so nice and, and say, okay, let's wait until the people is retired. Let's wait until the people die. No, I mean, you can wait, but then eh? you can use this, uh, this, um, money to bring people who really want. Yep. Good. Something else? Ah, nothing else? Good. Guys, I would like to thank you. You are amazing. My God, how can you support me? Almost one hour. Really, really. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> And I don't dance, I promise I will dance, but I will Congratulations, not dance. Congratulations, <laughs> Norma. It's been amazing. It's been very educational. I think having one of the lead DevOps experts close the gathering for this year has been, has been a truly amazing experience. <laughs> so a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. An honor. And I hope Belgrade treats you nice. Yes. <laughs> thank you, guys.